Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 616. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's August 25th, 2020. Okay, before I tell you where I am this week, uh, let's move on to your responsibility as a viewer of Anglican Unscripted, and that's it's simple. I don't, we don't ask a lot. We're not asking for boatloads of money. A little money would be nice. Uh, you don't have to send us a car. You don't have to send us mu much of anything except your love, your likes. If you could click the thumbs up on Facebook and on YouTube, and if you want to go to the comment section and comment on these shows, that would be great. Please share us a lot. I know you guys love the show, you watch the show, but you don't really share the show. Every once in a while I'll see you guys sharing the show. I need to see more sharing. You know, Christianity is about sharing. You can share Anglican Unscripted. This week, I find myself outside of Madison, Wisconsin again. We're en route to the Indiana Dunes. Uh, we spent last week up in Door County, which was very beautiful. I posted some pictures on Facebook. Uh, if you want to go to the comment section or should the show notes section on YouTube, you can find a link to my Facebook profile and George's. If you are not friends, please sign up to be our friends and you can follow our normal profile lives on facebook george how you doing uh, well kevin i was watching following your exploits on facebook the photos and you seem to be in the water most of the time can you actually stick your feet in the water of lake michigan or were they freeze solid or no, what's no, it like that uh, there? jill has decided uh canoeing is a fun hobby and so we went canoeing in uh, lake michigan and which is fine, but we had to paddle to some island called Horseshoe Bend Island or something, Horseshoe Island. And that was a lot of fun. And then we were in the Dells, Baraboo, too, last week. And we did canoeing again. And it's fun because as the person in the back of the canoe, I can control where we're going and I can kind of set the pace. So we're not doing the eight mile portage, we're doing the one mile. <laughs> down and back in an hour um so yeah we we do canoeing do a lot of bicycling but we also as you can see here we're in the rv doing our 40 45s and 50 hours of work uh fun is still for the weekends friday saturday and sunday um we're cloistered in here the rest of the time uh keeping our bosses happy uh how about you george what have you been up to busy times we're in the midst of planning our reopening um the uh, we've had a spike here of yeah. uh, the infection, and one of my lo one of my neighboring clergy friends, the vicar up at Holy uh, Faith Denellen, died of the COVID virus in a nursing home in Ocala. Mm. So we're uh, a little frightened. Uh, I I wish I wanted to open in April. Yes. I mean I was ready to go. <laughs> You've been talking and about this for a while. I've been, but. <laughs> You know, a good church is a collaborative church where basically people move in concert. And I have to find a way to get people. I've got a double. I've got a double thing to convince people who are healthy to come. But the problem is, and I think you shared this with me, your experience <laughs> in Connecticut, the sick people are going to come and the healthy yeah. people are going to stay away. Yeah. So I need to find a way to encourage the healthy to come. The sick to stay home, but not feel guilty about staying home. So it it this is all new to me, and I hope I I'm hope I'm going to do it right. But, it, but it's interesting. Our neighboring churches have reopened, and I've said to people, if you need to go to church uh, in the presence, go there. Nobody's going there, <laughs> and it, it's really fascinating to see. Uh, see how worship patterns are developed patterns are developing it's i think it's interesting because a lot of this is about the mask people don't mind worshiping online because they don't have to wear the mask they they can watch the service participate um, as much as you can in a, in a digital virtual format but to go to church and have a mask on the whole time when you're singing praying listening uh in the summer heat yeah for those churches with a Florida AC um, you're finding the 
25, 30, 35, 40 year olds aren't doing it. What we discovered in Connecticut is the people most at risk are willing to go to church and wear a mask because they so desire in COVID times that the relationships they have at church, they're willing to take the chance that uh, the, the younger people aren't. And it's this, this reverse psychology thing. You're like, wait a minute, that's not making sense. Why? No. And so that's what we're we, finding we, in Connecticut. We've kept, uh, we've kept our social outreach ministries functioning. So basically the homeless feeding and mm -hmm. uh, basically working with our migrant population. And I've had a huge uptick in the number of volunteers, people who want to come out and hand out canned goods and blankets on Thursdays and Tuesdays. And I uh, basically I'm saying, no, break it up, break it up, because basically they all sort of huddle together and chat and catch up. And the, oh, here's a can of tuna fish. OK, next. And then they talk to their friend. Uh, it, it's good that they have that relationship and that degree of fellowship, but it still isn't real for a lot of people, yeah. the COVID virus. And we read about people dying. and. We've had over 2,000 cases. We've had more cases in my county than they've had in some African nations. Like Uganda has been completely shut down for a long, for several months now. And we have more cases of COVID in my county than in all of Uganda. Yet we're not shut down. Uh, every, it's all voluntary. Um, that's just Florida. Yeah, I mean, for 50 days, Jill and I have been in this RV uh, touring uh, <laughs> much of the country. And we find basically when you go into an establishment, the staff, like a convenience store or a gas station like that, are wearing face masks. But in general, it's 50-50 whether or not the uh, customers are wearing face masks. And uh, Jill and I are very particular about our face mask, and we will not walk within uh, six, seven, maybe 10 feet of a person who's not wearing a mask because we don't want to blow this vacation <laughs> by catching the COVID. But there's this, this psychological thing where I don't know if the masks work or not, but I know when you see a person with a mask, you're willing to take the extra two steps to go around them. And I think it's just, it's this constant reminder that there is a virus out there and you need to avoid it. Uh, there's still, you know, whether or not the masks work or not, we won't, we won't know for years. There's a segment of the population where we live that is naturally contrarian. Mm -hmm. uh, they're the fellows that drive around and pick up trucks with a big Confederate flag flying and a Trump banner flying. And, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, there's a perception that the masks are basically big brother, the government telling them what to do. And they're not gonna be told what to do by anybody. So whether it's wear a mask or don't wear a mask, if the government tells you to do it, there's a good chunk of the people around here who will take offense at being told how to live their life. There's a, uh, I don't want to say we're on the frontier, but we certainly do have a frontier mindset that uh, you make the decisions, you, ch you make decisions of your own health and welfare based on your choices. And, you know, the government can give advice, but don't you dare tell me what to do. No, there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah, here, I mean, we went. We were in Madison a couple weeks ago. We were driving up to, to Door County, and the amount of Trump banners that were on all these silos, a uh, farmer silos, Trump 2020, Trump Pence 2020, all these yard signs. I'm like, uh, I didn't know that anybody supported Trump according to the media. And these are just the, the contrarians, the people who say, what do you mean? We have prospered under him. Yes, he's in, you know, for all intents and purposes, not a very nice guy. And, but these are the people who don't have Twitter accounts, but they love the policies that Trump has put forth. The other thing I've noticed is I've had half a dozen people contact me at the church saying, we've just moved here from New York City or from New York State or from New Jersey and let us know as soon as you start operations because we want to come worship with you. Hmm. And I've talked to some realtor friends and our real estate market is going oh. through the roof. Oh, absolutely. People are buying houses uh -huh. over the phone mm -hmm. to get out of New York yeah. and New York City and the, you know, the, uh, we're not getting people moving here from Park Avenue, but people moving from Staten Island and from Queens. The Bronx, Brooklyn, all that, absolutely, sure. 
you know, they they are they're moving up and they, you know, what do you have? Three bedroom, two bath for two hundred twenty five thousand. Well, here's the choices. So, so uh, and it, and George, you're right. It's being done over the phone. We have friends who paid thirty percent more for a house over the phone, uh, just so they could escape uh, the big cities. Um, people are like, guys, is there any Anglican news? No, it's August. There's not really any Anglican news. I think the big topic I wanted to talk about was universities and whether they're going to survive COVID. Um, the fact that we were able to banter about other stuff for <laughs> 10 minutes is amazing. George, I have a son who's a sophomore in college. He doesn't want to go back. Uh, he's uh, not going to go back to University of Wisconsin. He's going to transfer to the Pittsburgh area and go to school there. And we're trying to figure out what is the value of an online education versus an in-person education. Because for all sorts of purposes, in person is over for at least the next six to eight months. Nobody's going to classes. If they do, um, it's not going to be the same type of environment in the lecture halls. Uh, be much smaller classes. The older professors aren't going to be one at teaching. They're not going to have one-in-one -on -one sessions. They're not going to be tutoring like they uh, did before. The university system of 2019 is over. Will the universities survive, George? Some will. Mm -hmm. The ones that have billions upon yeah. billions upon billions of, an announce, of endowments, yeah. they will survive. They'll fritter their money away on administrators and diversity officers and things. Mm -hmm. But the smaller uh, colleges, I don't think, are going to survive because they, their product it, it used to be that your ticket into the middle class, into a professional life, was a university education. Mm -hmm. And that has been true for since the Second World War. Now a university degree, for all intents and purposes, counts for what a high school diploma counted for before the Second World War. And now it's the expectation among middle class people is your child will go on to graduate school and get some sort of professional degree. Yeah, you wasted four years learning basket weaving and uh, interpretive dance. Now you have to go get a nursing degree or a teacher certificate or a something, something, something to sure. make you employable. And we, we've reached the point where there's no uh, value added for a, an undergraduate university degree. And especially in a college that is not meeting. You're not building the social networks. You're not making the friends and things of that nature uh, that you do at a university campus. Uh, you're staying in your bedroom in your pajamas, reading Russian literature. Well, hold on. And you have to ask yourself, you know, is this worth forty thousand dollars <laughs> or more? Uh, and that's that's the strange thing about all this because university was America. Americana. You know, you went there and you were going to get a good job. Whether or not you had a good degree, you could get your French uh, art uh, mid century medieval uh, history degree and still get a, you know, a relatively good job working at the university bookstore. But that's gone. So, how are we going to educate our kids? And what I, the most interesting thing I saw in the news is Texas, Tennessee educators want parents to sign away the rights that they will audit the kids classes online and i'm like way whoa 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 why can't i see what you're teaching my children and it's probably worse at the universities and i guess that kind of just shows you um we've lost complete perspective of what they're teaching in our public schools george public schools and in the university system. The, uh, the problem of systematic racism, which I have expressed doubts about how it is being used. I think the greater problem facing minorities and the poor in this country is the ed educational system. The teachers union is a greater threat to blacks, okay. black of African Americans than the Ku Klux Klan is. Mm -hmm. You have uh, these uh, unions, uh, Connecticut, uh, I, when I was uh, helping at a 
parish there, one of the parishioners was a, a school administrator. This is 30 years ago, and they were, and I remember chatting, and I learned that they were making about $175,000 a year as a school superintendent. I yeah. mean, just, this is 30 years ago, ungodly sums of money, and it's only going higher. Um, no. Yeah, it's, it's, it's now 325 but you know, down in Florida, a school administrator makes about forty-two thousand. I mean, it's we don't have you have big bigger tax base, but the schools exist to enrich the students and the the not the schools exist in many parts of the country not to educate students, but to enrich administrators and the teachers' unions. Individual teachers do fantastic jobs, but the way the unions have so corrupted the education system. That I don't think it's it's not retrievable. It's not retrievable in its current form. Well, it's not. I mean, Yale is going to be the perfect example. I hate that we have to keep bringing it up, but Yale was just found guilty of racism last week in a report uh, issued by uh, I forget which government agency did this, but Department it said, of Education. Department of Education said, "Wait a minute." You're overlooking qualified white students and qualified Asian students solely on their skin color. You and based on grades and based on education and based on everything else, uh, a minority of certain skin color is much more likely to be chosen to be a student at Yale. And I'm like, well, that's 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 racism. We're not supposed to do that. And then there's colleges all over the South that says, listen, we understand that the um, the black experience is different. We're going to start allowing our black students to be segregated in housing on the campuses. And it's not I'm the like, South, Kevin. It's New York University. Yeah, it's New York now University. It's segregated housing. And I'm like, um, that that's racism. You you you're going back to the 1950s. You're going back to the 40s. The 1860s, that's not too far away. And it, it's confusing to me because people are being racist and they don't know it. They don't, they don't understand that anti-white is still racism. Anti-Asian is racism. Anti-Native uh, American is racism. And they don't see it. They don't care as long as they can promote their agenda. That's my, my two cents. So uh, I would love to see Yale fail. Yale needs to be rebooted. And I hope COVID is an ability for us to get hold of our public education again, to recontrol our university systems again, to understand what they're teaching our kids, to be uh, more participatory in what they're teaching our kids. Um, if anything good of COVID comes, it would be a reboot of the education system, at least here in America. I went to religious affiliated schools, including universities, mm -hmm. my entire educational system from kindergarten all through the undergraduate school. And it's not so much getting the Bible into the classroom, but getting the right people teaching yes. the Bible. I mean, when I was at divinity school at Yale, the uh, basically the job of the, the, the Bible theology, the New Testament instructors was to show you why this was all untrue and a construct of uh, fiction a social construct yes. okay. it you know it it wasn't uh, there was one of the things I've seen in the church that over the past 25 years is the decline of the, of the influence of the universities and the professoriate once upon a time theological professors had a very powerful voice in the deliberations of the church that has disappeared for all intents and purposes, such that when a theolo when somebody who says I teach New Testament at the General Divinity at the uh, Church Divinity School of the Pacific, and this is why I think X Y Z, I hate to say my mind immediately shuts off, because I know that they, my experience has been that they come from a particular, you know, in that case, a feminist, uh, womanist. Uh, Liberal. point of view yeah. that that says nothing to the American experience and to the people with whom I'm serving and working. Yeah. The universities have lost their 
uh, the pursuit of truth uh, to uh, a pursuit of fashion and fad and partisanship. And it's the same way with the, uh, the leadership of the church. So much of the church is divorced from the reality of the local life and the worshiping life and that the bishops have become an end unto themselves and they're just so div you know we have these riots in Kenosha Wisconsin and the Episcopal Bishop of, Wis of Milwaukee puts out a statement blaming the police and we should be justifiably outraged for all intents and purposes the Bishop of Milwaukee is encouraging more rioting he's not uh, he's not the adult in the room he's just another bleeding voice of unthinking uncritical trendiness it was not a good moment for him and it's certainly not a, this is not a good moment for the church in all things we want to be sure that uh, we don't rush to conclusions we have seen so often in the past 20 30 years that we are quick to judge and we are embarrassed when we were wrong or corrected by video or corrected by statements um, and you and I as reporters know first reports are often wrong first report the accounts you know uh, the perfect example is 9-11 a my first report was a small plane had crashed into tower one that was on the radio for 15 minutes that was the first reports and you know we as a uh, people need to sit back pay attention and do not be too quick to judge so. there, uh, I'm, I'm con con you mentioned earlier that we've really not touched upon church affairs and this has sort of become a Seinfeld episode this is a, nothing. <laughs> no, nothing. <laughs> but the but there are there's, there are there is church news going on, but it's it's sort of ephemeral stuff that has no last. It's mildly interesting. Uh, priest kidnapped in Nigeria. Priest released the next day. You know, just there's a lot of filler, but the work of the church as, as an institution during the COVID crisis has essentially come to a stop uh, as a witness to the world as a. Uh, as a participant in the public square of intellectual life, this has been one of the churches, the institutional church's worst moments. Yeah, I, um, I have to, I, I fully agree with you, George, that um, a lost church, a church with no flavor, with no salt, is standing up and say, hey, look over here. Nobody's looking. Mm, yeah, I mean. Sad. But here's the funny thing, on the local level, lives are being changed, mm -hmm. things are moving, things are happening. Their re revival, I think, is gonna be breaking out. Uh, the spirit can't be contained by the constitution and canons of the Episcopal Church. It's gonna move it where it will. Well, society is largely gonna change in the next few months. Most governors have uh, told Landlords, they can't evict people because they lost their jobs or not paying the rent. At some point, that's going to change, and you're going to find a lot of homeless people. You're going to find a lot of people that are in need of the services of a church and are in need of services of care, love, and comfort. And I hope the church is ready for when that happens. You know, this is your wake-up call. A whole lot of stuff is going to happen really quickly in the next two or three months. Well, the Episcopal Church is preparing by saying, go out and burn some stuff down and feel, make yourself feel good about it. Ah, uh, jeez. Ah, I hope we've encouraged and helped people with, with this week's show, George. Yeah, we, we, at the pre-show, we're like, well, there's no news. Let's just turn the camera on and talk. And we did. Guys, I, I want to thank you for watching this episode. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 616 of Anglican Unscripted.